I am saying to you that I didn't kill her. I had no knowledge of the killing, and I'm an innocent man. What was meant to be a Christmas holiday turned out to be a tragic event that took the innocent life of a vibrant young lady by the name of Sophie Toscan de Plantier. Discovered by her neighbor, Sophie's body was found lying motionless outside her home. How did this happen, and who could have committed such a barbaric act? West Cork, Ireland, a region known for its breathtaking landscapes and rich cultural heritage, its population enjoys a unique blending of serene rural life and vibrant community spirit. Known for its historical sites and scenic beauty, the area offers a mixture of recreational and cultural experiences, from exploring ancient ruins to enjoying local arts. The residents are known for their welcoming nature and strong sense of community, and while it maintains a relatively low crime rate, the area gained notoriety for the unsolved case of Sophie Toscan de Plantier, a tragedy that stands out in this otherwise peaceful region. Born in the vibrant heart of Paris on July 28, 1957, Sophie grew up surrounded by the elegance and affluence of a wealthy French family. From her early years, she was drawn to the glitz and glamour of the film industry, a world where creativity and vision reigned supreme. She didn't just dip her toes in, she dove in head first, carving a name for herself as a television producer. In 1991, her life took a romantic turn when she married Daniel Toscan de Plantier, a name that echoed prestige within the French film circles. And together, they became a power couple, their lives a tapestry of red carpets, camera flashes, and artistic influence. They shared their Parisian life with Sophie's teenage son from her first marriage, a bond that illustrated the depth and warmth of her character. She was a force of nature, a woman of impulse and determination. She knew her mind, pursued her goals with vigor, and stood firmly for justice and morality. She had a backbone of steel, a trait admired by those who knew her, especially her son, the center of her world. Sophie and her son, Pierre Louis, shared an unbreakable bond. Despite the demands of her high-profile career, she remained deeply involved in his life, a testament to her role as a devoted mother. Their life in Paris, though glamorous, was constantly under the microscope. As prominent figures in the television and film industry, their days were full of shoots, awards, and the relentless buzz of media attention. But even amidst this whirlwind of fame and success, Sophie sought refuge. She had found her solace in Skibbereen, a quaint town in West Cork, Ireland. Known for its charm and solitude, it was a haven for artists and writers, its serene landscapes a canvas for inspiration. Her connection to this place ran deep, a thread that wove through the summers of her childhood. In 1993, she purchased a secluded cottage, a personal escape from the chaos of Paris. This cottage, though beloved by Sophie, was not without its quirks. Isolated and sometimes difficult to access, it was plagued with unreliable heating and occasional power cuts and far from perfect. Yet Sophie was enamored with its rustic charm. It was her sanctuary, a place where she could recharge and reconnect with herself, away from the relentless pace of her professional life. Sophie's visits to Skibbereen were often solo journeys, a testament to her independent spirit. In December of 1996, seeking a respite before the festive rush, she made one such journey, unaware of the tragic fate that awaited her. It was a trip meant for peace and solitude, but ended in a mystery that would haunt the tranquil streets of Skibbereen and shock the entire world. On December the 20th of 1996, Sophie arrived at Cork Airport alone with plans to spend the Christmas holidays in the tranquil setting of her cottage. Far from the bustling life in Paris, she had made her way to her secluded home in West Cork, and during the following days, she would be seen around town, engaging in simple errands and chatting with local business owners. Here, in this quiet corner of the world, she embraced the peaceful life that she cherished. Sophie's relationship with the locals of Skibbereen was deeply rooted, many of whom had known her since her childhood summer spent in the town. To them, she was still Sophie, the girl who had grown up amongst them, returning each summer with her family. 
These days leading up to Christmas appeared unremarkable, with no hint of the horror that was about to unfold in this otherwise peaceful town. The morning of December 23, 1996 brought a chilling discovery. At around 10 a.m., Sophie's neighbor Shirley Foster alerted the police. Outside of Sophie's home, on the lane leading to her house, laid a body. It was in such a state that Sophie's identity was not immediately recognizable. The Garda, the Irish police, arrived shortly afterwards, beginning their preliminary investigation. The scene they encountered would be grim. The victim, later confirmed to be Sophie, was dressed in a nightgown and pajamas, most notably wearing boots, indicating that she had ventured outside intentionally. Beside her lay a concrete block stained with blood, likely the murder weapon. Blood traces were found on the gate, along the path leading to the back door, where the keys were still in the lock from the inside. And inside, two wine glasses sat on a drying rack, and nothing appeared out of place, suggesting that the tragic event had occurred outside. The investigation, however, was marred by critical delay. The state pathologist tasked with examining her body did not arrive at the scene until 28 hours after she was discovered, and for those 28 hours, her body remained outside, exposed to the cold and the rain, only covered by a few plastic sheets. This delay allowed vital evidence to be washed away and contaminated by the weather, casting a shadow over the investigation. This unfortunate beginning would set the tone for what would become a frustrating and unsolved case. Once Sophie's body was finally examined, the grim reality of her final moments became clear. Her hands bore defensive wounds and scratches, signs of a desperate struggle for survival. The severe blow she sustained to the back of her head and face would render her barely recognizable. Tragically, pinpointing the exact time of her death would be impossible. The cold weather had significantly affected the state of her body, leaving investigators in the dark about when this tragic event took place. The investigation scene did provide a few clues. The patches of blood found on the gate and back door indicated no signs of a struggle inside the house. The fact that Sophie was wearing boots over her pajamas suggested she either stepped out briefly or was lured outside by someone or something. The two wine glasses in the kitchen did not conclusively indicate the presence of a second person as they could have been from the previous day. Amongst the collected blood samples, only one did not belong to Sophie, and given the limitations of DNA testing in 1996, this was a crucial but fragile lead. With scant evidence at the scene, the police began retracing Sophie's steps from the time of her arrival at the cottage in order to build a timeline. On December the 21st, the day after she arrived in Skibbereen, Sophie was seen shopping in town, engaging with several locals. A shop owner recalled noticing a man in a black coat and hat who seemed to be watching her and even followed her after she left. The evening before her death on December 22nd, she had taken a walk to Three Castle Head, a remote trail near Skibbereen with a stunning view that includes the ruins of Dunlau Castle, dating back to the 13th century. This area is steeped in local folklore, particularly the legend of the White Lady, a spirit of a heartbroken bride who, in a tragic twist of fate, threw herself off the clifftop after her father accidentally killed her new husband. It's said that an encounter with the White Lady forebodes tragedy, and during her walk, Sophie claimed to have seen this spectral figure and later shared her eerie experience with friends, expressing her genuine fear. After visiting with friends, she then stepped by the local pub for tea, casually chatting with neighbors. She returned to her isolated cottage around 6 p.m., and the last known contact was a phone call with her husband Daniel around midnight from Paris. Then, in the span between midnight and 10 a.m. the next day, someone ended Sophie Tuscan de Plantier's life. Initially, the police had focused on Daniel, Sophie's husband, as they investigated her tragic death. The couple's relationship had been strained, with Sophie discovering Daniel's infidelity and grappling with her own affair, which she had resolved to end before her trip to Skibbereen. 
Her journey to the isolated cottage was in part an escape from the turmoil of her impending separation. However, both Daniel and the man with whom Sophie was involved were both in France at the time of her death, far from the scene in Ireland. As the investigation progressed, the police pursued the limited leads they had. Skibbereen's Christmas atmosphere was overshadowed by whispers and speculation about the case. Locals pointed fingers at tourists, but the police suspected a different angle. They believed the crime was committed by someone familiar with the area, someone who knew the remote roads that led to Sophie's cottage. After gathering testimony and conducting interviews around the town, the police's attention then shifted to one individual, Ian Bailey. Ian Kenneth Bailey, born in Manchester, England in January of 1957, led a life of varied pursuits. In his earlier years, he had worked as a freelance journalist and dabbled in various other trades, which included fish farming and running a market stall where he sold pizzas alongside his poetry. His journey took a turn in 1991 when he moved to Ireland, setting in Goline with his partner from 1992 onwards. Bailey was no stranger to the local police. Having been involved in previous incidents of domestic violence towards his partner, which had resulted in her hospitalization. In 2001, he faced conviction for assault in district court. A psychiatrist's report prepared for a murder trial painted a picture of a complex personality, marked with narcissism, rigidity, impulsiveness, and a craving for recognition. Alcohol had reportedly unlocked his violent tendencies. Following his divorce, Bailey had lived with Jules Thomas, another Skibbereen local, and on December 23rd, the morning after Sophie's body was discovered, Ian and Jules headed to the crime scene, seeking information for a story. Despite being turned away by officers, Bailey was determined to gather details for his article. Bailey's reporting on the incident began to raise eyebrows. His articles, full of intimate details of the case and speculation about Sophie's personal life, would suggest a deeper knowledge of the situation. He even ventured to the crime scene under the pretext of delivering groceries. His articles, which speculated on Sophie's affairs and hinted at knowledge of her personal life, prompted Sophie's family to refute the rumors publicly. As the case unfolded, Bailey's behavior and writings attracted the attention of investigators, and despite his claims of only knowing Sophie from around town, some neighbors insisted they had been introduced. Bailey's theories in his articles, which included speculation about a hitman hired by her ex-husband, were scrutinized by the authorities. Meanwhile, a key testimony emerged. An anonymous tip reported a sighting of a man near Sophie's house at 3 a.m. on December the 23rd, matching the description of a man seen following her two days before. Marie Farrell, the shop owner, provided this tip due to her presence at the bridge with another man. Her description led the police to identify Bailey as that man in question. Bailey would be interviewed a couple of days after the murder and had visible scratches on his arms and face, which he attributed to cutting down a Christmas tree. However, no photos of these injuries were taken, preventing further evaluation. As a suspect, Bailey reiterated his hitman theory, but police were increasingly convinced that the perpetrator was someone who was familiar with the local area. On February the 10th of 1997, Ian Bailey faced the gripping reality of arrest. The police, following leads in the case, searched his home, finding remnants of a fire in his yard. A neighbor had reported seeing smoke just days after the incident, a detail that Bailey had dismissed, claiming a fire earlier in December. And despite the search, no concrete evidence connecting him to the murder surfaced at his home or studio. Jules Thomas, Bailey's partner, was also brought in for questioning, and she recounted their night at the local pub, followed by a drive through the valley, stopping at a viewpoint overlooking Sophie's cottage, where the lights were still on. Ian remarked that something bad might happen that night. However, Jules mentioned they returned home afterwards, contradicting his initial claims of staying in bed the entire evening. When questioned about his inconsistency, he changed his story, claiming a late-night visit to his studio. 
Jules didn't see him until 9 a.m. the next morning, noticing a wound on his face, which she thought might have been pre-existing. Held for 12 hours without physical evidence linking him to the crime scene, he would then be released. The media, however, had branded him the main suspect, a narrative that left him infuriated and seemingly impacted his mental health. Reports of bizarre behavior like howling at the moon and claiming to possess a magical stick had surfaced, adding to the speculative frenzy. Neighbors whispered about confessions Bailey allegedly made, later dismissed as dark humor. And as the investigation stalled, Bailey faced arrest once again on January 27th of 1998. The police, lacking substantial evidence, had hoped for a confession by implying that they had incriminating proof. However, the only blood traces at the scene did not match any profiles and were heavily contaminated. The body's prolonged exposure to the elements, along with lost evidence, including a blood-stained gate from Sophie's house, weakened the case. With no charges forthcoming after a 12-hour hold, Bailey was once again released. Irish law stipulates that a person can only be arrested and held twice without formal charges, and on both occasions, Bailey maintained his innocence. The investigation's approach, which seemed to pressure Bailey into a confession, had backfired, positioning him as a victim in the public eye. Despite many believing in his guilt, Bailey invited the press after his arrest to declare his innocence and decree the witch hunt against him. I chose, because I'm a journalist and I know how journalists work, to talk to them. What do you mean? I was, um, it was made absolutely certain to me by all my interrogating officers that I was the murderer. They had no doubt. They knew it was me. They just needed me to confess. My identity was out there. I didn't give my identity out. I note this morning in the Examiner that the Gardashi Akana are saying that they didn't release my name. But who did? I was presented with a situation where the world had been told, in effect, this is the man. If they had evidence, I wouldn't be here talking to you. I, I wouldn't have been released. Yeah, yeah. Well... I know I'm, I'm innocent. I have nothing to do with this killing. Did you kill him? No. The police faced intense criticism for their handling of the case, and with no new evidence or leads, the investigation would grow cold. In 2003, Bailey sued several news outlets for defamation, but the trial, bolstered by witness testimony and police files, had turned against him. The files, now public, detailed the police's suspicion of him, convincing the public further of his potential involvement in the murder. Ian Bailey's trial against the media, intended to clear his name, only intensified public suspicion about his involvement in Sophie's murder. During the trial, key witness Marie Farrell recounted seeing Bailey twice near the crime scene, claiming that he had threatened her to change her statement. Bailey's history of domestic violence, including three assaults on his partner Jules six months prior to the incident, also surfaced and painted him as a violent man in the public eye. Despite the mounting suspicion, the Director of Public Prosecutions announced there was insufficient evidence to charge Bailey with the crime. Sophie's family, dissatisfied with the Irish legal proceedings, then turned to the French judicial system, which allowed for prosecution on circumstantial evidence. In 2008, Sophie's family requested the transfer of files to France, leading to a trial in absentia against Bailey. Meanwhile, Marie Farrell had retracted her statement and confessed to falsely accusing Bailey out of fear, claiming the police had pressured her. I am telling the truth now. Why would I put myself in the spotlight like this if I wasn't telling the truth? This revelation would cast doubt on the entire investigation, revealing potential manipulation of evidence. In November of 2014, Bailey sued the Irish state for wrongful targeting, centering his legal defense on Pharrell's retracted statements. However, Pharrell refused to reveal the name of her companion that night, and her subsequent courtroom behavior severely damaged her credibility and Bailey's case. By 2019, the French trial commenced without Bailey's presence. Over 30 witnesses were called, and under French law, Bailey was found guilty 
and sentenced to 25 years in prison. The Irish High Court would refuse to extradite him due to insufficient evidence, allowing Bailey to remain in Ireland, but restricted from traveling to any other European countries due to an international arrest warrant. In 2022, Irish police announced a review of the unsolved murder, revealing a new lead which involved an associate of Sophie's late husband, Daniel. This development suggested a potential new suspect in the case, widening the scope of the investigation to include collaboration between Irish and French authorities. Then, in a dramatic turn of events, Ian Bailey died of a suspected cardiac arrest outside of his residence in January of 2024. Following his death, the police searched his flat, seized various personal items for a DNA profile, and in a bid to uncover any new evidence that could shed light on the long-standing mystery of Sophie's untimely demise. In the wake of Ian Bailey's death, her family continues to seek closure. This tragic mystery, woven with complexity and elusive truth, remains an open wound for them. Sophie's son, embodying the family's enduring quest for answers, has been a vocal advocate for justice. And here's what he had to say. With Bailey's death, Sophie's family and our association as self will never be able to obtain a confession from Ian Bailey. We continue our efforts for truth and justice. An investigation is still underway in Ireland and we are confident that the discovery of new elements, the hearing of new witnesses and the revelation of possible complicity will enable Irish police to close the case finally, 27 years after my mother murdered. What are your thoughts on this unresolved mystery? And how do you believe the case could have been handled differently? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And if there's a case you'd like us to cover, feel free to drop your recommendation. For more captivating true crime stories, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.